Welcome, everybody. I'm Colin Singer. Welcome to our webinar on the Canada Startup Visa Program. Uh, joining in this presentation today is uh, Mana Hosseini, who is the president of the Immigration.ca Business Advisory Group. We have Rob Butler, who is vice president, and myself, uh, immigration lawyer and founder of Immigration.ca. Just a short note, if any of you are uh, entrepreneurs and you're looking to relocate to Canada under the Canada Startup Visa Program, you've found the right place. This is going to be a lively discussion on some really important topics that you need to know. However, if you are not an entrepreneur, an individual who has business experience, this might not be the right forum for you and you might want to look at the questionnaire on immigration.ca. There's a, a, a menu of questionnaires and you might wanna fill out um, a questionnaire that is not for business immigrants, for business entrepreneurs to Canada. Um, first off, um, we're, we're going to start off uh, hearing from Mana on some of the important elements of the three uh, streams in the business startup visa uh, cycle. Uh, of course, we're talking about a VC, we're talking about incubators, and we're talking about angel investor groups. Those are the three categories uh, that you would be interested in um, uh, listening to and finding information. So Mana, without further ado, uh, let me hear, let, let us take it over to you. Uh, thank you, Colin. So yes, today I'm going to talk about the difference between the VC, meaning venture capital firms, and angel investors and incubators, which are designated entities. Well, for startup visa, uh, per government rules, you need to have an innovative startup that can compete on a global scale, and you have to be willing to bring your startup to Canada and expand. Now, what is the difference between these designated um, organizations? Because we get many questions per day that what is the difference between, um, let's say, incubator or what is the difference between venture capital firms and angel investors? And the better question is that which one is better and what are the fees associated and what type of startup they're looking at? So the main difference is that incubators, they look for earlier stage companies rather than angel investors and venture capital. So usually angel investment uh, firms and also venture capital firms, they look for uh, startups with some sort of traction with users or uh, startups that they have higher valuation than um, 750,000. And usually they want the product to be built rather than incubators that they can work because of their experience in the local market, they can work with earlier stage startups, such as they could be concept based or they could be at MVP or they could be at the customer um, acquisition um, uh, area. So it's so, so it's solely so this is one of the so that's one of the main reasons solely based on how early stage or how later stage your startup is at. And the second thing, it's your funding options. So if you, for example, if you want to get any sort of investment from angel investor venture capitals, you need to show that you're willing to invest at least 200,000 or 300,000 as a startup also in your own project or you already have invested. Uh, plus that, of course, from your other expenses that you're, you, you have, you built uh, your product and, uh, and you spent on all your other professional fees. And the third difference is that angel investment firms and venture capital firms, because they want to invest in your startup, they have a more detailed due diligence report. That's why it takes longer to get the letter of support. And also uh, there are more approvals in these two sectors rather than incubators because, uh, because their due diligence reports are more detailed and they require much more information rather than the incubator stream. But again, that doesn't mean that incubators are bad or incubators are good that, because there's many incubators that have maybe even more detailed uh, due diligence reports than some of the angel investment groups. So that so that also depends on the designated entity's reputation, their mandates, 
and what type of startups they're looking for. So I think if you do your research, you'll know which one is best for your startup. Okay. Um, perhaps the uh, question that people want to know is once you get the commitment certificate, once you're been issued, your business concept has been vetted by your um, incubator or, or your angel, or in some cases, uh, VC has issued a commitment certificate. Bear in mind, uh, if you're getting a commitment certificate from a VC, uh, it means that the VC has conducted its due diligence and you now have a $200,000 commitment uh, of investment going into your startup business. Uh, if you are an angel, that is only a $75,000 commitment. And if you are an incubator, as uh, Mana uh, outlined earlier, you're really at the earliest stages of your business project, and you've presented uh, the metrics uh, to the incubator, and they've uh, felt. Mana, give some perspective on uh, if one receives, what does $75,000 represent in the ecosystem? If one is getting $75,000 from an angel, what does that mean in terms of what the project, what the entrepreneurs need to uh, come to the table with during the process, as opposed to a VC where you're getting 200,000? Obviously, we know well, 200,000 is obviously much more impacting, but how can individuals who are choosing to become part of an angel investment uh, commitment, uh, what should they be looking at in terms of making this project work uh, overall? Well, overall, if you're getting angel investment, usually a member of an angel investment group invests. Usually angel investors don't have a fund, yeah, venture capitals, they have LPs and they have a fund. So they're more able to uh, put more funds. That's why they can put 200,000 rather than angel investors, which is an individual member of that angel investment group that is putting 75,000. And again, it depends on your need, how early stage and how much funds do you need and how much funds you have in operation. Usually in angel investors, they would invest in early stage companies too, depending on the potential and the management team and depending on your market and depending on the sector that they're really interested in and depending on the angel group and depending, again, their term sheets, because both of these angel investors and uh, venture capitals, they have different term sheets for sometimes different projects, or they could have one sort of term sheet. So it, it all depends on the negotiation and, uh, and type of funding that the company is looking for. Because the minimum investment for angel investors is 75,000, but I have seen in the ecosystem that they're angel investors that they're putting 85,000. They're, put, they're angel investors that are putting 100,000. They're angel investors that are putting 125,000. So it all depends on their valuation and due diligence report and all the negotiations that they're making with the company. But again, that's 75 is the minimum, but they don't have to put exactly 75. And then same thing for venture capitals. That's the minimum mandate by government, that's 200,000. But there are venture capitals that they're putting 240,000, 260,000, or even 300,000, depending on how much revenue the startup has and on their negotiations and what type of terms they're offering and what type of terms the company is accepting. It comes to that. Because the because the term sheet and every everything that they're doing, such as their valuation and due diligence reports, has to match the market standard. So it has to match um, what they're doing with the local companies too. So that's why uh, it all depends. As an it's an investment, it's a genuine investment, and it all depends on the negotiation between the entrepreneur and uh, the investor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> you know. We've seen from our experience, two thoughts come to my mind. Uh, we know for a fact some of Canada's unicorns in the startup visa uh, ecosystem uh, have come from incubation projects. Uh, what comes to my mind is a ply board. Uh, that was, if I recall, Mana, correct me if I'm wrong, but that was an incubation project from the start, was it not? They went, yes, yes. They went to uh, an incubator in Waterloo 
um, which they're very picky and they have very detailed um, due diligence report that they solely work with applicants directly. So, yes. If I recall, Skip the Dishes was another unicorn, but that was with an incubation uh, that was uh, out of, uh, if I recall, it was in Manitoba? Yes, but that's, but they were from Toronto, so they didn't come through Startup Visa, but yes. Did not come from Startup Visa, okay. Um, so, you know, if one is going to uh, come to the table with a, a project, they, 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 um, they want to go into the Startup Visa uh, program, what, from your experience, what project, what does a project need to have realistically? Of course, it varies on the type of concept project that you've put together, that you've got on the table, um, but what kind of financing would one need to have to credibly come to the table, whether you're going into incubation, whether you're going into the angel or a VC, what kind of funding could reasonably one uh, need to, to be looking at in overall, whether it's a combination of uh, deep pockets from one of the members of the team or more than one, or it's a combination of deep pockets plus the commitment from a VC or an angel? What are we talking about generally, could we say? I think as a team, they should be looking at minimum of 200,000 to put in the project. So now that doesn't matter if it's one applicant or two applicants, just as a team, a minimum of 200,000. Because um, funding is very important in startups. And um, it, depending on the sector the startup is in and depending on their funding needs and depending on uh, their fundraising, and operations and how uh, expensive it is, is I would say the bare minimum is 200,000 that the team should be willing to spend in their own project while they want to expand to Canada because that's, you know, that's a capable CEO. <laughs> if you don't want to invest in your own project, why would anyone else invest it? I always say that if you don't, if you're not investing in your own project, why would I invest in your project <laughs> if you don't believe it enough? And funding is very important. It's one of the you know first reasons that most of the startups fail. And talking about incubators, um, yes, there are many unicorns coming from incubators because the success of startups it doesn't matter that you know what type of like if if they're going to incubator or angel investor venture capital solely that what stage the company is at and what is their needs. And um, I have seen so many great incubators that they do an awesome job and they connect entrepreneurs with investors and they incubate them, they train them and they coach them. And once they're in Canada, they help them with fundraising, with angel investors and venture capitals and the companies have scaled up. And most of the companies, I would, I would want to point out that I would say more than 90% of the startups are great for, they need, they need incubation of some sort because they're still coming to Canada, even though, even let's say they have revenue of 100,000, 200,000, that doesn't, that doesn't matter. They still need incubation. They still need coaching and they still need so much handholding and help, which incubators have the mentors, have the experience, they have the program, they have the cohorts. And they're capable of uh, training these entrepreneurs and making introductions to, let's say, accountants or other professionals or help them with uh, expanding or customer acquisitions or sales and marketing. So I would say more than 90% of the startups, they need that, or I would say even 100%. But also they need funding too. So the best combination is that, the best combination I have seen in the ecosystem is that investors that they also uh train and you know they're active in the company and they can coach the company um coming to canada and they also invest of course that's the best of two worlds but um anyway these are my comments and this has been my experience with most of the companies that we have seen in startup visa very much so what we've also seen mana uh is that and people need to know uh that you might have a con you might have a, a startup that uh is overseas and the founders are overseas and they're for different reasons and there's a lot of dynamics uh, uh going along uh, out taking place you know globally uh, and for different reasons a company might want to uh relocate to canada 
and, and they might want to uh, become involved in the Canadian startup ecosystem for, for many, many positive reasons. So, but that does not require the foreign company to fully relocate all its shareholders and all its team into Canada. For example, we, we have a company that we know of that uh, the, the founder uh, is in Europe and, and wants to relocate the company to Canada. Uh, in other words, create a, a major uh, a branch of, of the foreign uh, company. And so the founder may not be interested in relocating to Canada but uh, the co-entrepreneurs are going to relocate and they're going to uh, establish a, a great anchor in Canada. So uh, I guess it's, it's fair to say uh, for those who have a great uh, startup uh, with you know, uh, scalability uh, and they're looking to come into Canada, which offers many advantages corporately, uh, fiscally, uh, and from a, a resource point of view, um, one need not uh, be committed to relocating to Canada and seeking immigration and seeking a work permit. Uh, for many people who have uh, reasons to stay grounded in a, a foreign jurisdiction, um, there's a there's the the potential is 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 possible for you to avail the benefits of the Canadian startup visa, the Canadian startup ecosystem, without needing to want to actually relocate yourself to Canada. Well, the startups that I have seen that usually they have revenue they're in, in their home country, they will keep that startup, they will keep that office because they have users, they have clients, they have partners. And I think Canada encourages that because one of the mandates is that the startup has to compete on a global scale. Like how, how can you compete if you don't have international partners and connections and, uh, you know, so uh, they always keep that. So that's, you know, and I think it's, it makes the due diligence, you know, uh, easier and it makes, it's just, they always, yeah, they always do that. And they might have few co-founders and they might have some of the executives in the company that they're running uh, the startup in, let's say, uh, Korea or Nigeria or Vietnam or, and they don't want to relocate right now per se. Let's say they have a CFO that they don't want to relocate. They have a CMO that they don't want to relocate right now. But the other co-founders, let's say their CTO or the CEO wants to uh, relocate and uh, start this startup visa like company. And that's why they use the startup visa. But uh, I have seen so many startups that they have shareholders, even in the Canadian company, that some of them, they're not uh, seeking the permanent residency or work permit, and they might want to come at a later date. And they send maybe two or three co-founders to start the business here. So very, very well noted. So uh, if anyone joining on this uh, presentation today, if you have uh, a startup that's perhaps uh, in the early stages of traction and you're looking to uh, maybe not commit right now to relocating to Canada, <clears throat> you can participate in this program <clears throat> with some of your co-founders who might be interested in setting up shop in Canada for various reasons. Um, I wanna move on to a topic, we, we wanna perhaps move on. Uh, of course, most people when they're going into this program you know, you need certain essential documentation, essential uh, undertakings uh, in order to even submit an application. And of course, everyone knows that you need a commitment certificate. You need a letter of support from one of the delegated authorities called designated entities. And we want to share and, and, and bring to light that, of course, receiving a commitment certificate receiving a letter of support by itself is not does not assure one does not assure your admission to canada under the program and what we want to bring to light is that there are areas where uh, a certificate has been issued there are instances where a certificate has been issued and one can still uh, be refused and what could those situations be grounds for refusal uh, so, you know, just getting a commitment certificate uh, for an applicant who's who's looking to go into the program, and when they get that certificate, the the workload doesn't end there. Okay, it's very important that an individual, a team, 
going to Canada, getting the commitment certificate, your work does not end there. So obviously you're first and foremost interested in, in, in engaging in business, in, in developing and, and pursuing um, a business opportunity in a, um, the field that you've uh, launched your project. Um, hopefully it's, it's innovative, but I mean, not everybody can create a LinkedIn and a Twitter and a Facebook, uh, but there has to be some component of innovation. Uh, grounds for refusal, uh, could very well be as, as, uh, Mana pointed out, you don't have enough funding. You, it's not reasonable that your project, uh, as presented and the finances of each of the team members, as is one of the requirements to demonstrate. Uh, you just don't have reasonable funding. Uh, and so from what Mana has pointed out and what we've seen, uh, projects routinely have at least $200,000 to incur a cash burn of 18 months, 24 months. Uh, of course, most of the time, the project team members, there's always someone in there who's got a, um, a technology background. Of course, you've got uh, people with that bring to the table different backgrounds, but surely technology is going to be an anchor in the project. Um, but you need funding, and, and and notwithstanding that, some of the work could be done by the technology people, and and some of the people involved in the project might be uh, PhD students in in labs in Canada. Um, you still need to show solid, solid funding. And that is uh, an area that many people overlook. If you're going into the project, you've gone to an incubator, you're getting your letter of support, you really do need uh, more funding perhaps uh, than uh, if you were to get a VC to, to commit a $240,000 uh, investment. So it's very important that one uh, really uh, verifies and, and, and plans to have the right funding to cover uh, at least, at least 12 to 18, possibly 24 months. And that is not something you're going to see in the regulations. You're not going to see that as the minimum requirements. What you will see in the regulations is the settlement funding. And the settlement funding is a LICO uh, annual uh, amount that a family of five needs to have. And you're going to see amounts of family of five might be $24,000. Uh, but real, realistically, when this is going to be vetted by uh, immigration um, uh, department, you need to show sufficient funding. Um, there's another area that needs to be addressed, and that again is getting the certificate by itself. Uh, again, as uh, I've, I pointed out, is not sufficient. Uh, once you've got the green light, it, it can turn yellow. It could turn red if you're not advancing your project. So if you have gone into a project, if you're working with people uh, who tell you, we've got the certificate, everything is a go, everything's a green light. Well, it's really important that you know that you need to show progress. You need to be involved in developing your project at some incremental level. Now, the burden of development will be much higher if you have uh, sought uh, a work permit. So there are many people who, we, who come to us and of course they do want early entry. Uh, and, and it's acknowledged that the popularity of this project, this stream uh, has really increased over the last two, two years. Uh, so there's many people who are promoting this program from all different backgrounds. Um, but it's important that you understand, number one, uh, seeking a work permit, you have to be an essential member of the team. Uh, and if you're going to seek a work permit and you've been uh, given the, uh, you've been clothed with the designation that you're essential and generally a team of four or a team of five, well, it's probably one or two people that are essential. When you come to Canada, the jurisprudence has, is overwhelming. It's overwhelming that you need to show what are you doing in Canada? How are you advancing your project? Uh, and there has to be a fine line between, well, you haven't yet been approved as a permanent resident to Canada, uh, but at the same time, you do need to show that first and foremost, you wanna develop this project. You wanna move forward 
uh, in developing a prototype or in even perhaps developing uh, letters of intent uh, for the purchase of some of your project components. Uh, so if you were to have letters of intent, that is a very favorable um, uh, development. Mana, any, any thoughts on, on some of these issues uh, that I uh, have been pointing out? Um, I totally agree with you because um, the work permits for startup visa so far, it has been granted for one year. So right now the permanent residency is taking 30 plus months. So the entrepreneur needs to extend the work permit. Then they need to show for the next year that they have what they have been doing in the first year, or then after the second year, they still need to, if they need to extend, they need to show, you know, what they have been doing on the first year and now second year. So that's one of the components that they have to, you know, they, they still have to submit it to IRCC and they can be refused if they don't, you know, show sufficient evidence that they have been working on uh, their company. And I think um, their roadmap is very important. The roadmap that they have told the design entity that they give them a lot of support, the roadmap that they have there in their business plan, that's it. very important that at least 50% of it they're implementing, or at least they have been trying and they have evidence of it of that and they're actively participating in their business because this pro this program is not a passive investment program at all it's not even an investment program <laughs> so it's so just necessarily they paid the professional fees uh of um of the professionals to get uh to get a lot of support or for their projects or for everything that's not enough at all like they really need to participate and show activity until they get their permanent residency, because there are many instances in the market that with many representatives, they get, uh, they get, you know, from IRCC, they're getting letters that they want updates. What have you been doing? Or they're starting to ask the entities, you know, what is the startup doing and or the updates? So now the designated entities, some of them that uh, I have seen, they're starting to ask for progress report and they're starting to uh, basically encourage all the companies to keep all the updates and be active and uh, and collaborate with them and help them if necessary. <clears throat> and to your point, Mana, uh, what we what we what we know in in our uh, projects, um, you know, we have a, a range of of developments that need to be. You know, there's a, there's a, a range of of uh, undertakings that we need to have in all our projects. Uh, intellectual property has to be fully, fully vetted through. Uh, corporate structure has to be fully vetted through. Uh, so, you know, when one is going to even go forward and develop a prototype, well, heck, you've got to have your intellectual property all squared out. Uh, and that takes commitment. That takes investment. Uh, you know, letters patent are very expensive. Uh, not every, not everything qualifies for uh, letters patent. But uh, depending on your concept. Uh, you really have to uh, show credibility uh, that a normal, prudent business and uh, business, uh, you know, professional would do, and and that would include getting all your ducks in order. Uh, if you're going to be in Canada, let's suppose you are uh, incorporated in one jurisdiction, but you want to operate in other jurisdictions in Canada. So, uh, you know, you, you would have to have the various registrations in those various jurisdictions. You need to have websites developed. You need to have, you know, really strong, as if you're a prudent business professional, you want to show, and you want to be showing that you're actively developing. But again, there is this kind of balance because processing times used to be 16 months, they've they've gravitated to 30, which we we all believe, uh, given the annual levels that government has projected over the next three years, these delays should come down in theory with the the commitment of investment by government. IRCC has put together um, a roadmap of investing literally across all streams, of course, billions of dollars that they plan. They've hired. Uh, or are plans to hire. I don't know they've done that hiring all, but 1,250 just case processing professionals in IRCC. So you need to find that right balance between uh, committing all the way through, you're not approved yet, uh, and showing and demonstrating what a prudent business professional would be doing and, and getting all your, your ducks in order. Um, 
I also want to bring to light, again, you know, we've, we've covered very clearly, PR is not a short when you get your commitment certificate. Um, and, you know, processing delays, I want to just point out again, um, <clears throat> for, for the 2017, 2018 period, the annual levels, <clears throat> there was, I believe, 750 individuals that were going to be admitted through the program. And each year, you know, we're publishing content on a regular basis at immigration.ca, which shows this prolific rise on a percentage basis, but not on absolute basis, on a percentage basis, the rise of individuals coming to Canada under SUV is, is very substantive. It's so incredible, uh, these annual increases. But again, on a per on a on a on an absolute basis, it's not that high. Seven hundred and fifty individuals, including applicant and family. But what we're seeing over the next three years, so for twenty nine for twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one, it went up to one thousand per year. But bear in mind, starting next year, you have thirty five hundred individuals coming through SUV program. In the following year, twenty twenty four, government has projected. 5,000 individuals coming through the program. And by 2025, the annual levels are now projecting 6,000 individuals coming through this program. So it's pretty clear government is finally uh, in, in tandem with the increased levels overall. They are acknowledging the, 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 the inventory, they're acknowledging uh, bear in mind the volume of cases across all streams up till November 2022 uh, was 2.4 million. Uh, it was at 1.2.7 earlier in the summer. It's come down a bit and we project it to come down more. So we're hoping that the processing times will come more, uh, let's just say closer to 16 months, which was the original target. Um, but if you are, you know, thinking, oh, the government's going to take years anyway, I don't have to do very much. Unfortunately, you can't take that approach. You need to go forward with your project uh, and 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 advance on an incremental basis. Um, and, you know, what we're seeing in, in, in reality, with such a volume of cases going through the system across all streams, the volume of refusals is increasing. The, there is just a, a shortage of, of people who are trained in this area, uh, and we're seeing gyrations, unexplained refusals, which we've managed to overturn one of them. We had a work permit that the individual was completely uh, qualified for in all respects, and we were able to overturn that uh, negative finding. Uh, and it was clear that the policies by government were not followed. Uh, but one can expect, unfortunately, this is it, it goes with the territory. When you have a Titanic of applications that Canada is now moving into, uh, you're going to have unexplained refusals. And in so that being said, it's really important that uh, you have your application so well documented, so well perfected, uh, because the opportunity for judicial review. Uh, for many of these cases will be uh, very clear when when a, a, a lawyer is looking at these types of situations. Um, there are cases that need to be addressed. And if you're working with a firm that has been behind the application, uh, legal trained professionals, uh, as opposed to consultants, and there's great consultants out there, and make no mistake about that, but it's really only a licensed attorney that will be able to uh, to make a difference in your application. So I just wanted to put it out there that uh, the, the kind of work that we're doing and putting together, uh, we're hopeful that you know our cases are all going to go sail through, but it's not reasonable to think that way because there are there's mistakes going on across the board and it's really important that you're sorted out with a, a legal team that has uh, uh, all the ducks in order so that if the unfortunate develops and your case is rejected for some unsubstantiated reason that a legal trained uh, team uh, has identified, you will be in a position to address the injustice in question. Um, I think 
uh, what we want to show um, is uh, uh, w what's our process? Like, Rob, uh, could you give some some perspective uh, on on the process that we follow uh, when people come to uh, come to us and 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 uh, are looking to participate in this project in this program? Yeah, I think there's different aspects that you kind of both touched on um, through. Uh the event but i, I want to kind of bring it all together and uh and then you guys of course can jump in to add any flavor but you know the biggest thing when you're you know with the process you're working with immigration.ca is that you know there there are two parallel functions going on at the same time uh there's the legal side uh on the immigration process and then there's also the business side as well so there's two things happening and when you are you know, become our client, you know, you do have a team of professionals that are working for you. So, you know, you have this full power of the, of the organization that's there for you. Um, you know, we have a very experienced business advisory team uh, with a lot of, uh, a lot of experience, high, highly educated, um, very experienced in startups and, you know, finance and scaling and marketing and really understand the, uh, the Canadian and international marketplace. So you have access to all that, um, you know, and of course, uh, our immigration lawyers, uh, that are there to help, uh, on the immigration side. So, um, you know, that's, that's a big advantage. Um, you know, when it comes to what we're doing, you know, when we kick off this process and you come with your uh, with your startup, you know, we are absolutely there to, you know, guide you, uh, you know, around the different uh, levels of your startups, uh, like Mono was alluding to. Um, uh, we're there to make sure that it's buttoned up and tied up and, you know, really guiding you and coaching you because uh, we know the marketplace uh, very well. Um, you know, once we have that, of course, we absolutely are training you uh, and talking to you uh, uh, and helping you how to, you know, present and interact with the various designated entities. Uh, it's, you know, it's a crucial point if you don't have experience in that area. Uh, you know, once uh, we kind of move in uh, to the process, into the due diligence, of course, you know, we are there uh, by your side, helping, uh, again, guiding you through that due diligence, uh, process, uh, uh, which is crucial. And like Mana said, all different levels of due diligence, we understand all of it and we're there to help you, uh, you know, with that. Also it, during this business process, there's been, you know, this is, you know, the startup world is a lot around valuation. Uh, you know, you, you probably don't have a lot of experience on, on how to value a business, especially in uh, the North American marketplace in Canada, you know, we're there to help and we have, uh, you know, uh, different, uh, uh, you know, standards and kind of know where things should be. And we can help you uh, through that piece. Um, you got to have, you know, we're going to be there to help guide you create, uh, you know, a go to market strategy, obviously very important. And we want to tie that into, you know, what's necessary. And, you know, Colin did talk about how, uh, you know, making sure you got your traction and, and keeping this business moving along. Uh, so that go to market strategy and execution strategy is very, very crucial. And what that looks like from, the day you become a client, uh, all the way up to PR, and then of course beyond for uh, for your uh, investors, um, and then we're, of course we're a big part of helping you flush out corporate governance. And then you talked a lot about the intellectual property and filing patents. We're there to help because uh, uh, you might not have that experience. Um, you know, also how how you're going to market in the country and beyond the country, and what are those kind of levers, uh, as well as you know how to acquire sales and client acquisition. So you know we're we're there to help guide and help you with uh, that as well. Um, and then legal pieces around on the corporate side, you know, from negotiating term sheets. Uh, um, and I think I mentioned corporate governance. Like that, that's all very important aspects uh, that uh, you know we're here to help guide and make sure that uh, that you're taken care of. Um, and then, uh, you know, on the, on the, on the legal side, uh, of course, putting those, uh, and building your immigration file, uh, absolutely important, making sure those I's are dotted, T's are crossed, uh, and that it, uh, you know, no mistakes on the files, um, very important and, and there to help you through that process. Uh, you know, maybe you have to go into a peer review and then the business team's there to help, uh, you know, and, and guide you and, and coach you on that piece. Uh, all the way up to potentially, you know, like Colin had mentioned, uh, being rejected on your PR and having that legal team there uh, right beside you to, uh, you know, to to appeal that and uh, and to ultimately get it overturned. So there's a lot of 
pieces happening and you have this full team uh, behind you uh, that helps you get your you know, startup off the ground and into Canada and, uh, and launching. Anything else, guys, you would want to add? I think that's pretty complete. Thanks so much for that. Um, so if you're interested, if one uh, is interested in um, looking at your prospects uh, to um, Canada under the startup visa program, um, there's a range of businesses that you could be uh, involved in. I mean, there's, there's, there's no particular industry uh, that uh, is too, is, is, is saturated or too innovative uh, or not innovative enough. You, you have such a range of, of industries that can be acceptable. Uh, Mana, do you want to just give some idea on some of uh, the uh, businesses that we have sailing through the system right now? So we have uh, startups in many sectors. We have startups in medical devices. So we're very uh, familiar with the medical uh, classes and how to get the licenses and permits and approved clinical trials. Um, we also have SaaS companies, softwares, which they don't have IP and that's fine. So that's why on the IP part, on the intellectual part, uh, property part, I wanted to make a note that some of the startups, they really don't have IP, but they have a great market and, uh, and that's okay, like SaaS companies. And then uh, we also have companies that they're in advanced manufacturing. Uh, we have right now companies that uh, we have actually two companies that they're in clean tech and recycling. We have one impact startup. So uh, they had an AI to detect uh, breast cancer. So that was really good. And that's one of my favorite sectors for impact. Then we have um, insurance tech. We have two uh, fintechs, which is a big right now topic in around the world, especially in Canada. And there's so many gaps to close in Canada for fintech. And uh, we have um, also few types of manufacturings that they're relocating to Canada from uh, different countries, from India, from Iran, from Korea. We have actually a very good, uh, great startup from Korea that they're in cosmetics, as Korea is one of the biggest <laughs> uh, competitors in that industry. And yeah, we have. I think we we have startups in most of the sectors that I can think of. Even farm tech, we got a couple of farm tech. That's cool. Oil and gas tech as well. You know, this is a lot of different sectors. To Colin's point, that uh, you know, highly innovative. Uh, and there's a lot of passion around the world in those different sectors. So it's nice to have those people with those expertise to come to Canada to to flush out those uh, startups. So if one is interested in um, in, in inquiring uh as to whether you might be a good candidate uh to canada under the suv program uh take the liberty of going to immigration.ca on the uh evaluation page there is a, a menu item for the startup visa program complete the form obviously as 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 complete as you can uh give us the best information about your background and uh we'll be able to get back to you uh quite um Quite in, a, in a quite timely manner. Uh, we'll be able to speak with you, uh, give you some insight on our thoughts uh, as to whether you um, would be a good candidate under the uh, SUV program. Um, that pretty much concludes what we wanted to share with you on the presentation side. Now what we're going to do is uh, open the uh, floor to questions. Uh, we have about uh, 15 minutes left, uh, so we're going to um, uh, encourage you uh, to the, the, the participants today, uh, please sh send in some of your questions. And uh, as we can, we're going to glance and uh, develop uh, some dialogue and discussion on, on some uh, pointed questions. So I, 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 I uh, lead the floor over to you guys now uh, out there uh, uh, following us. And I see there's a, a good 210 people so far. Um, so please, um, send in some of your questions and we're going to get right back to you. Thanks so much.